Thank you so much for joining us. We already have some people in chat like Juan and Marianne. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, yeah, other than that, we have uh, myself, Robbie Boleland here, a Sony Imaging Specialist, along with Jason Etzel, who's joining us today to help join us here for this lovely portrait mirrorless Monday. How's everyone doing today? Well, we're going to assume that they're doing well because we don't have them mic'd up. That's oh. true. <laughs> but how are you doing today, Jason? <laughs> I am doing great, Robbie. Awesome. It's, it's a mirrorless Monday for the ages. And a Labor Day at that. So if you guys are here in the U.S., I hope you guys are relaxing. I have a little cup of soda here just to kind of relax. And um, yeah, let us know if our audios uh, could be fixed up a little bit. If the music in the background is too high, I can lower it. If you guys don't hear us too well, let us know in the chat and we'll be able to respond to that. Because today is going to be mostly about, you know, portraiture. Uh, I know New York Fashion Week is going to be happening next week, which is going to be very exciting. So I did want to touch up on those topics as well, uh, because I do have some experience there where I worked with an influencer and we were able to get in to some of those um, like um, uh, those displays where they have all the different looks going out. So it'll be really cool. Yeah, all it's, right. it's really that good time of year. And, you know, Fashion Week really kicks off... Uh, everything that is becoming like our next season, especially in the New York City area for photographers. I know a lot of people view pumpkin spice lattes as the start of the, the fall and the autumn, but this is also really that last gasp you have of doing a lot of like outdoor and environmental portraiture before you start to freeze. We still got some colors out there, still, still a few extra some, hours of daylight. And, yeah, you know? some nice weather and everything else, yeah. Ram is over here in chat as well. Uh, he said hello, Jason, Robbie, J.N. Reynold said hello, everyone, and uh, yeah, another beautiful day. So um, I have some photographs we could talk about. We have some preloaded questions as well to kind of get us off the ground running. Um, but other than that, if you guys do have any questions, feel free again to ask, and uh, we'll go over some of the photographs too. How's that sound, Jason? It sounds like a plan. Let's start the laissez-faire Labor Day Monday mirrorless segment. Yeah, it's a very relaxing day, so please feel free and uh, ask as many questions as you want. We can have a conversation. I know there's a slight delay, maybe 40 seconds, um, hopefully 30. We're trying to improve that every day. But uh, yeah, as always, feel free to ask any questions. But let's move forward. So here, right off the bat, we do have a uh, runway shot here. I love the look here as well. Um, and I was able to just get, I was, I was not a photographer with the other photographers. I was actually hanging out with the influencer where we had seats available in this situation. So I was able to get a cool different perspective into my experiences as well. And, uh, for the most part, this was a few years back actually. So I was just running with the A7S original <laughs> and, uh, and honestly, 12 megapixels is plenty and you're able, I was preferring that for low light capability. Uh, but one thing to be really mindful of is the fact that, you know, the runway is typically professionally lit up. So uh, in terms of bringing your own light, I don't think you necessarily uh, need it. Uh, but there is uh, probably if you're able to get anyone like any influencers looks because they're typically during New York Fashion Week, the other influencers are going to be wearing other like uh, designers clothes. So you'll be able to ask any of these questions in terms of who the designer was if you want to reach out to them. And uh, yeah, everything else. Let's go. Uh, this one, I this is one of my favorite shots here. Um, uh, sitting in that area, I was there was a part. There's two parts where they looped around, right? So one was really up close. And because I was behind so many people, I could only really just get the top of the top half of their bodies i could just get a portrait but i wasn't able to get the full body and there was just this one little like opening in that spot here where i was able to get the full body and seeing the silhouette of all the other photographers all the cell phone photographers uh it's uh it was a really cool um exposure and a situational thing i kind of prepped for it uh, as other models passed through, I was able to kind of pre-focus because my lens there was just a manual focusing lens. And uh, yeah, the reason why the crowd is silhouetted is because the runways specifically are lit up in that tiny line. So uh, the lighting was already perfect. 
in that situation as well. Here was a designer who decided to have their runway in an apartment with music in the background. It was a very um, relaxing moment here. And uh, we were able to get, you know, I was more up close and personal here. So I was using a wide angle lens, a 20 millimeter lens. And I was able to get some shots here. And I was also, uh, oh, this was from the original one as well. Uh, so this one was a very lucky shot. Maybe timing was right, but normally runway models typically look straight, but this one was a more laid back designer. And so the models were able to engage the rest of the attendees and everyone else. And luckily she just looked over me while I was behind maybe one row and she was able to look at my camera here and I was able to capture that shot. So that's one of the shots where I was very happy and excited for. But as Jason said, the New York City Fashion Week is definitely an endurance contest because this was definitely an all day event. There was so many different places to go. There's multiple, multiple designers showing up and uh, really like, uh, you know, showcasing their work. So if you are working with a, say, um say a designer then that's going to be one thing that you have to kind of uh prepare for just because it's a it's a constant thing that's happening as well cool yeah and one thing to look out for really is for designers they're really looking out for uh let's see oh, okay cool akiva said the lag is only 10 to 12 seconds perfect for any questions if you guys do have any over there i was about to say we're doing good on the lag but it took you i think about a minute and a half from akiva so <laughs> but we were absorbed in the material but yeah we are doing a lot better on feedback time today indeed indeed um but yeah so here uh one of the things that i was looking for really is fabric and what their stylistic choices were here as well and i was able to see uh, that's what i wanted to capture in this photograph as well and this is casey ma she's an influencer i actually was working with um that i met coincidentally she forgot her water bottle and um we were able to i was willing to just help her get her water bottle back because it was one of those clean canteens ones they, they cost like 40 dollars, so that made sense uh she's a, actually a really sweet person she's currently in um uh on uh what's that one of the she's in a reality television show now and she just recently moved to california so um it's really cool to see her grow uh, but yeah, during this time, she was really my connection to get into the New York Fashion Week. Uh, but there's definitely a lot of things to think about if you are, if you don't have access to New York Fashion Week, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't really matter. Like if you go to where they normally, uh, go to showcase, then, um, then you could just take pictures of other people who are leaving ask them who the designers are if you like those style of their clothing uh, that day in particular is a really good day where you can ask them to take a photograph so don't be afraid to go out and uh ask to take a portrait of them i'm sure they'd be extremely happy to um and if you maybe show them a picture that you were extremely happy with they'd want you to send it to them and then your relationship can grow from there as well let's see mark says no sound no video happy to oh i got sound yeah well we're, we should be good here let's just uh check out your browser there mark it could be as simple as just doing a refresh we're seeing you here in the chat um you should be good on most browsers so just give it a refresh make sure all your plugins are enabled and you should be fine yep uh, keep us up to date on there mark yeah for sure let us know uh hopefully oh he probably can't hear us <laughs> <laughs> Let's say that in chat. <laughs> oh, thank you for saying browser yeah. refresh. I appreciate it, Jason. Mm -hmm. All right, moving forward. Um, so with working with Casey Ma, she does have um, access to other designer things that they want her to wear when she's in attendance. So this is me trying to showcase um, those outfits or maybe the products like the bags and whatnot. Um, but yeah. Uh, so what I was saying was I didn't want to keep this stuck on New York Fashion Week uh, solely on New York Fashion Week. I wanted to also open up portraiture in general. So um, I did want to talk about my other experiences in portraiture as well. Um, I took a trip uh, to Cuba in 2018 
Uh, I was uh, given an opportunity to go study abroad while I was still in college. That was my last year. And um, so I wanted to see that like Cuba. I haven't been there. I wasn't sure if the if we were able to travel there in the future, uh, depending on what would happen. So I wanted to take the opportunity to go. And it, it was here where I was able to make some connections while during my visit. Awesome. Eric says we sound great. Perfect. We love to hear it. So here I was actually visiting. Uh, I was visiting a, uh, a farm that was making the, um, what's that? The cigars. Uh, and this is one of their kids who came in horseback. Just like, just, I don't know how young he is, but he's already riding horses, which I thought was amazing. He was uh, at the place where we were, we were visiting. He was just coming in, coming home, essentially. So that was his mode of transportation. And I was able to snap that quick shot over there. Oh, yeah. So here's one of the uh, cigar makers and she was just showing us the quality and uh, where they're being manufactured and totals told us pretty much the situation in Cuba since it is a uh, communist uh, country and how they kind of share the, the profits and everything else. So it was really cool learning experience uh, over there as well. And we also met some tattoo artists. And so in terms of environmental portraiture, what I try to do really is just show like kind of a piece of who the people are to kind of show where they are, or, like what they're from. And you could kind of get some context clues from the things around them. Here, I really like the catch light from his glasses. So catch light essentially is how like it's typically for your eyes in general. So it's you're able to see how the light is affecting the subject here. And in this situation, you could see the fence uh, in his uh, house there where he was tattooing everyone. And you were able to kind of see his uh, like the area or you could see if you're doing studio lighting, you could see how the lighting is kind of set up. So if you do check out portraits in like a magazine, you could kind of figure out how the light is. If there's a circle in the top right of their eye, they either used like um, maybe an octobox or maybe an umbrella. So there's a lot of things to keep in mind of as well uh, when it comes down to you know um, trying to set up your own lighting setups and kind of get um, you know get some influence from there because you're never really copying anyone's style you're making it your own when you take these photographs yourself so I always use it as a learning experience and yeah that's pretty much how I do it <laughs> The show up, see what happens. Of, yeah. Uh, lighting and modification. Yeah, exactly. And we'll talk about lighting as well. Cool. Let's see. Uh, so back to um, to New York Fashion Week. I did want to show where you could also potentially be uh, when it comes down to uh, to being a photographer during New York Fashion Week. So if you are capable of shooting alongside your fellow photographers it is kind of a brawl out there when you are competing with other photographers you can see in the back over here there's a lot of people set up with video camcorders and like cameras as well and it's this situation where like if you're working for gettys or trying to get photographs into gettys they need those photographs right away so that's where um something like a ftp uh, server and being able to upload those pictures is such a big deal because for those situations they need to be out there really really fast very responsive so um, Jason maybe like the a1 is a really great camera right because oh a1 for sure right now and some people be like wait for like the shooting speeds it's about the horsepower of what it could do and Robbie just hinted at the FTP capability there it's moving high-res files now at lightning fast speed I mean, part of the Alpha One's design was really for sports and for photojournalism. But when you think about it, Fashion Week, it's like, I'm in one spot. I will not be able to walk like two feet. <laughs> There's no room. My office is going to be where I'm shooting from. So it's vital that you have that kind of connection and that kind of speed capabilities to offload to clients that quick. Because 30 seconds later, that model's off the runway, that look has passed, and they're on to the next one. Exactly. Exactly. That's why uh, cameras like the A1 or the A92, they have a giganet, giga, giganet, gigabit <laughs> Ethernet point 
Um, and that's the one that has, uh, that's where you could FTP transfer through that. So it would be like lightning fast to upload it right away, especially if it's a larger designer. And uh, you could get that kind of information out there. But uh, I also want to know, the, you guys here in attendance, what kind of portraiture are you looking for? What, you're, what are you trying to improve? Or maybe, you know, what kind of portraiture do you like taking photographs off? Do you take photographs in the studio? Uh, do you like natural lighting? Do you want to get into studio lighting? I would love to know more um, in the chat as well. All right? Uh, lighting. The one uh, we know we could probably we could probably dedicate a whole solid month of mirrorless Mondays to just lighting. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because there's uh, there's so much to take in, shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, and then there's also you know <laughs> there's also throwing in the strobe, and that's a completely different component as well. Our illusion right. of control as photographers. We're going to make sure the light is exactly what we want it to be. Yeah. And yeah those exactly. are called studio photographers. Uh, yep. That's you controlling light. Literally. Pa that's painting us literally. Because we don't want any variables like a cloud. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I have a few more portraits here as well. So we'll be able to look over that. And I also have a few other examples here as well to kind of help us set it up as well. But yeah, you can see how nice the soft lighting is for this uh, runway as well, which I thought was really interesting. And I, I always try to see how they set up the light, but it looks so simple half the time. Uh, but you can see how the lighting here, just in the past, how it's lit both ways, forward and back, and then it's still taking the light away from the attendees as well. Not so much as the one picture, but here, again, uh, environment portraiture, just meeting strangers and being able to ask them like, hey, you guys are looking like you're trying to take a photograph, do you mind if I take a photograph for you guys? And one of the nice things about the Sony cameras is that you can use Imaging Edge Mobile to transfer that photograph to your phone pretty instantaneously. So, so you could just like send it to their Instagram. It's a really great way, I think, to kind of uh, social, like just meet people and just be social about it. And in addition, if you have some of the stuff in your EXIF information, when you send over a file sometimes, there's the contact information, there's your own profile. <laughs> so if you're just meeting some people, it's like, hey, here's where you can see more of my work. It's all in oh, the yeah. file. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, cool. We got Brian who says Studio Preferred. We'll be talking about that. Exterior Portrait. I think this might be a good example for you there, Natalie. Um, and awesome. And yes, Brian. We are kind of control freaks. <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll go into that. Brian Brian knows exactly what I mean by yeah. that one. But there is a lot to be done within studio walls as well as outside studio walls. Absolutely. And there is that wonderful world of combining both. Exactly. So this one here, uh, there's about 20 people in this photograph here. And I was just hanging out during the Japan Festival. Uh, so... It was this situation where I met the New York City uh, Lolita uh, group and they were all just looking amazing. So I asked them like, hey, do you guys want quick portrait shots before I had to be where I needed to be? And I had the A7S III and the 100mm STF. If you guys have seen Mirrorless Mondays before, you probably know that that's the lens that I love just because of the shallow depth of field. But maybe the question is, how did I get 20 portraitures portraits in 20 minutes and that was essentially just letting them walk i was really focused on and luckily that day had an overcast so lighting was already perfect uh just because i didn't have to worry too much about the harsh lighting where they needed to go so i didn't have to be mindful of maybe they should stay in the shadows that way the light's even and it's not harsh on on the face here so what i told them to do was i wanted to get full body shots first and then i wanted to get tight shots here right so I just had them all line up to get ready in a queue. And then I told them just to start from that uh, that fire. What's, what do you call that thing, Jason? The <laughs> that thing in the sun? The thing, the circle thing by the feet. The sewer grate? The sewer thing. That's where I told the them manhole, to go. Manhole, technically. But the yeah. manhole, yeah. I told them to go to the manhole cover. Uh, and I told them to start walking towards me. And that's how I did it. And then I would tell them next for when I wanted to have another person join or start a new person to, to take a portrait of. 
Um, and thank you, Jason, for answering that. Santos asked, what is the name of the app that you could send pics from the camera to the phones? Uh, and that is the Imaging Edge Mobile. It is available on Apple and Android as well. And I will say that A7IV's quality of life has been a crazy game changer just because you can just connect it via Bluetooth and you don't have to uh, take a QR picture, QR code picture, and uh, you don't have to really struggle to have um, like, uh, what's that? Like, just to keep making a new connection essentially. If you're connected you via a, Bluetooth. You're, you're already saved as like a cache connection. And yeah. it's already gone through all the security uh, protocols. So in this case, everyone's always concerned, hey, my phone is paired to my camera. What if someone just you know, wants to hack into the memory card or something? It's all based mm -hmm. on your individual camera, your phone, no one else can really get in. And that exactly. QR code protects it. And when it's off, you could actually access it while it's off with the a7 IV. I don't think any other uh, camera system yet has been able to do that. So I was very excited to see that feature as well, if you guys were considering the a7 IV. So here is a quick uh, example of me just going, uh, like them walking up to me. Again, I do love the glasses and the catch light here. You could actually see the background behind me and everything else. So the white light is probably the the sky that's over uh, overexposed there. And here is another tight shot. And these are moving very quickly. Uh, the A7S III has a new autofocusing system in comparison to the A7S Mark II, and that's where it's using the same processor as the A1, so it's able to be very fast in terms of capturing eye autofocus. So I just had them walking up to me, and I was able to get at least, you know, 20 different shots where it's full body and then tight as well, and it was just locked onto their eyes using the eye autofocus. So in terms of the settings here, I had autofocus continuous, I had the face and eye detect on as well to prioritize an eye that's most forward. And then I also had the, uh, uh, I also had real time tracking set up for a focusing area. Um, and it's this where like, fo like real time tracking is going to be one of the biggest game changers because it just locks onto the subject, whether they're moving around, like moving forward, moving backwards, they're going to be locked onto the subject as well. So it doesn't matter if they're just walking towards you, they're just, it's just gonna be locked on no matter what. And also one thing here that Robbie has mentioned as well, cause he did 20 portraits in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people are like, oh my God, so many variables that can happen in that time. How did you keep up that consistency? Look at the shot that Robbie has up there right now. And as he noted, he had them go through a process to the circle in the middle of the street, as he originally called the manhole. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact is, in a street in New York City, unless you're in like Manhattan Hinge like hours, each side of the street is basically acting like a light filter for you. It's sort oh, of yeah. like why I mentioned why we are control freaks in the studios. You're managing light, you're not letting stuff get in or out. Right now, those buildings are basically acting as a protection. The only light coming in is really from overhead to where Robbie's shooting. Now, for some, that might be enough, that might not be enough, but it is going to be relatively constant because as the sun's going to be positioned for like the high noon hours, it's there, it's harsh, it's directly overhead. But until you're getting very near like the end of like golden hour, something like this, you're going to have very constant lighting coming through. Mm -hmm. Only so much could get between the buildings. That's why he's able to lock in and the A7S III and the 100 STF are doing a lot of the work for him with oh, that yeah. focus. But when it comes Absolutely. to like environmental portraiture, that's where I mentioned there before, if you can mix a little bit of like OCD, taking care of everything in this studio, metering everything to within a tenth of a stop, but you want to use some of that in an environmental structure, architecture is basically your biggest barn doors that you could find right now. Absolutely. Or literally a barn door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And being able to move. So this one, instead of just having the end of the street there, I was able to move to the left and strafe and get a different background. Here you can see just the trees. So I went lower to get the green in the background. Here I stepped back and I was able to get to the right side um, where I would see kind of the building areas. I wish those chairs weren't there, but those that's a little Photoshop well, thing I have know, to take care of in the future. They kind of work <laughs> and just positioning the trees behind the feathers there really help them pop up because if this were say fashion week, you've got to show the outfit that helps highlight. the feathers. Exactly, exactly. And the same thing for uh, these outfits as well. The, the texture of fabrics 
that's all something they want to want to include as well. So just be mindful of that and and consider the aperture and what's in focus as well. Because uh, I know we all love to be at the most wide open we can make it. But uh, in the case for a lot of influencers, they do want to focus on what they're wearing, who they're wearing. And uh, that's going to be another thing to, to consider as well. Yeah, the cool. little things that uh, go in there. But that's why I, you know, photography is always fun. Everything's an yeah. assignment. And, and Fashion <laughs> Week is an endurance contest. If you ever wanted, like Robbie, as you mentioned, he was with an influencer, got him in. He got to experience all these things. If you think about a day in the life of a shooter during Fashion Week, you're yeah. going between venues, you're working in tight spaces, you've got massive amounts of files to deliver in a timely manner. Oh, it's yeah. probably one of the better boot camps as far as throwing yourself into the fire. Yeah. Since this was actually one of the first things that happened, the, the group photo, I actually was able to send all the photographs from that day to my phone and I put them in a Google Photos album and I was able to send it to them that same, like within that 45 minute timeline. So that was also cool. We had a comment as well from Santos who said, I'm trying to learn high speed sync, wondering if phot photographers use high speed sync only out in bright backgrounds or indoors with low lights too. Like for example, at fashion shows indoors. Uh, thank you so much. Cool. Mm, high speed sync, always the fun stuff there with HHS. Oh yeah. Um, in some cases, Santos there, it's one of the more popular things our people do, love to use it outside, you know, overpower the sunlight. Um, but there are practical uses where people are like, hey, I've got to freeze action that fast. And that's why you're looking at such light output to either overpower the sun. But in a studio, same kind of things could be done, but you need a massive amount of light usually to make it work. But depending on the situation, there's a place for it. And it could be used a lot indoors and then outdoors. Yeah. Uh, for Fashion Week, though, I think they're they're pretty much covered. As Robbie mentioned, those runways are exclusively lit to not only just you know provide the best shooting experience for stills and videos, but it's like it has to showcase the fashion itself. Yeah. It needs to work with different types of materials. And keep in mind, when Fashion Week, when you're at a show and it ends, it's like you're at a concert and the house lights come back on and you start to see everything else. There's actual strategic lighting done to make sure you don't see people around the runway to give those depths. Like the silhouette shot Robbie had, the only way we could tell there was a silhouette is because of all the window light behind it showing where all oh, the people yeah. were. Let's see. So um, it's probably, probably dig pretty far back, but yeah. But there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Cause in some cases that's how lighting has to get finesse that much. So depending on what's going on indoors you can pretty much control yeah. everything let's see so what was my shutter purposes. speed here i could probably find out what the shutter speed was here all right go go gadget software <laughs> yep uh let's see one four hundredth of a second so yeah, yeah i was at iso 1000 one four hundredth of a second uh so that wasn't uh all too uh crazy but that's what the s mark one you had going there that was the s mark one uh, ah, classic, classic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, high speed sync. Really, if you want to bring it to you, uh, bring it with you with New York Fashion Week. That's really just to take out any of the ambient light even further because you're using your shutter speed as well. With the power of your strobe, you're able to just use you turn anywhere really a studio as long as you have those strobes available with you. Uh, and that's where you really just uh, want to get capture unique looks. And even though you're out in the city, you could take everything away. So if you want to just make it purely light and control everything through your strobes, then that's going to be the best way to do it with high speed sync. Um, and that's really the only situation where I would consider it uh, that fast action, anything where you really need to stop time. Uh, but I will say that strobes do have, um, I don't know, maybe like they, they strobe, depending on which ones, one ten thousand of a second. So completely different from your shutter speed. If you're not using high speed sync, your shutter speed doesn't matter at all other than affecting the ambient lighting. So in a studio, everything's pitch black. Your shutter speed doesn't matter. Uh, and I, I actually think I can show you guys that in a second as well. I cool will say this much in guys. addition while Robbie's digging out that image. Uh, one key is traveling light. So yeah. in some cases, if it were Fashion Week, odds are you're never going to have a place to even put your strobes down even at your feet because it's you can literally be spending 90 minutes to two hours within like two square feet. And yep. 
a lot of times traveling light and a lot of times stuff will be there ready to go but if you have something outdoors it is good to have some kind of strobe unit with you that can maybe fit in a bag or if your car is actually parked nearby where it's just you can get it when need be but traveling light very key we're getting yeah. our pumpkin spice season but i assure you you will be having a change of shirt at the end of the day uh. <laughs> exactly but a uh, great question Satsos. and i actually wanted to show you guys something as well um and what you probably notice here this is like a one light setup and i was really just looking for rembrandt lighting here and that's the uh correct me if i'm wrong jason it's been a while since i've done <laughs> studio port studio photography but it's the triangle over here um that shows in uh, that kind of forms a little triangle but I also wanted to keep in mind the different types of fabric that's also being displayed. So here I asked the model to have a silk photo, uh, silk um, uh, gown, and that way I could kind of show that reflection to extenuate during the strobe output as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of ways, like for studio lighting, to get like different colored shots using gels, maybe using or incorporating LED lights uh, with your photograph. Uh, that's where um, you know preparing for the shots is going to be uh, really important right so um one thing that did help me out while i was during covid everyone was locked down no one could really have a model there without it being a health risk so one thing that i did really like using was a a program called uh, elixir it's a let me see if i could pull it up here it's a 3d studio essentially i actually pulled up the program this is the program itself uh, and you could show and set up all the lighting here to show you guys, like, to kind of prepare how the look would look like. Um, so in this situation here, I have a reflector. I could move it back. And over here to the right, you could see that it's affecting the photograph as well. And you could also, you know, change the autofocusing areas. It's no mirrorless camera, unfortunately. <laughs> so you can't really just choose. Uh, but I guess this is more of like the DSLR kind of autofocusing Um here but you could kind of just work with that uh since you know they're 3d subjects uh <laughs> let me see if i could find a they don't here. have feelings it's okay they're yeah. animated uh -huh. this isn't sponsored by elixir at all but it, this did help me kind of prepare for uh you know any studio shots that i'm trying to get like ready for and you could actually see our equipment list here the umbrellas and you could also choose the different angles if you want to go lower or higher and you can also choose where the lights going if you want to move it and whenever you're ready you could just take a picture so over here i took a photograph and me and jason might be a little choppy but it will have to render the shot one second and it's showing you kind of like the studio layout as well which i thought was really cool yeah, and all this technology taking over what used to be like let's spend three hours in the studio and figure this all out uh, i know that's one of the biggest benefits for this as well is because uh, you can see what the end result will be, right? You can see mm -hmm. the fabric here. This was at f2.8 and I was using a 7200 millimeter lens at 124, 124 millimeter zoomed in and the shutter speeds at 1 1 25th of a second, right? Because these guys are, um, these guys are strobes, right? They're, they're, it doesn't matter what shutter speed I'm using. Even if I'm at 1 20th of a second, the lighting hasn't changed at all. Even if I'm at 1 1 25th of a second, the lighting hasn't changed because it is the, the shutter speed is kind of not, it doesn't matter because you're introducing the light in the situation, right? But what do you do if you're trying to include a LED light? And here, let's uh, go to our second model here in our studio. <laughs> Um, and let me move this uh, camera and aim it all the way over here. Well, now everyone knows there. what you do when you're not walking around with your S3 and your 100 STF lens. I know, it feels uh, weird. Oh, I got to turn off those lights here. Let me turn this off. Yep, there you go. <laughs> I got to turn off this light as well. I feel like I'm actually in the studio, which is kind of nice. Is there a way for so... you to trip over a cable? That'd be perfect. <laughs> Luckily, no. All right. They've uh... obviously been taped down. All right. <laughs> But yeah, okay, so we have our second model here and I have her sitting on a chair and uh, I have one um, uh, reflector umbrella uh, taking this shot here. And say I wanted to incorporate a, um, let's say a, um, we got continuous lighting as well. So we're gonna try to introduce continuous lighting here. 
and they have a lot of different options in terms of the different lights. So say I want a Titan tube over here somewhere and I want to change the color. So now in over here to the right, we can see exactly what's happening, right? And I want to change the color to, let's say primary red. And then I'm going to output this to be like really harsh and change the camera settings to maybe be F8 just because these are strobes. Maybe change it to F5. Let's reduce that. So aperture is going to be the biggest thing that captures light in this situation, especially when it comes to strobes. Um, that's because it's what allows light to come into the camera. Shutter speed is really just exposing the sensor, right? So if you have a strobe that takes a picture with that shutter speed, it doesn't matter. But the amount of light that comes in with the lens allows you to have more light or less light. So changing the aperture is going to be the biggest thing here when you're taking studio photography, right? So it's going to have a uh, more full depth of field and less light. So those are things to consider whether you want to have a stronger output for your strobes or if you want to have like if you want to introduce more ambient lighting. So this red light, if I take a picture, let's see, f6.3, let's maybe go to f5 here for this shot, maybe lower the angle, or maybe I should get lower. There you go. <laughs> and zoom out a little bit. And then I'll take a picture. So here we still have some of the red here uh, that's going on. And if I reduce that light a little bit, take another picture. Then we could also see here in the view and render this shot real quick. And this is what Robbie learned in his final year in school while he was in Cuba. <laughs> Not really, but yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, we learned a lot there too, but yeah, this thing has been really good in preparing the shot. And if you could also export the whole setup as well. So if you have any, um, uh, any um, helpers, they could kind of see what kind of look you're going for. So we see that the red isn't as strong. So what we would need to do in this situation, because it's a continuous lighting, this is where shutter speed is actually gonna have an effect. So if I reduce it to 1 20th of a second, then now we see that it's stronger in terms of the, the ambient lighting here. So in comparison to, uh, in comparison to the other strobe lights, uh, this is where shutter speed does matter because it is your ambient lighting. So I hope that helps you guys with uh, any studio questions. Let me know if you have any studio questions as well, because uh, I do think it's a really cool program. But yeah, here's where we saw the difference in terms of shutter speed, 1 20th of a second. And uh, yeah, so <laughs> we could also drag shutter with slower shutter speeds as well. And so that's like a lot of things will be traditional if you're using ambient lighting. But one cool thing to do to see how ambient lighting can affect your photograph is to turn off all your strobes and you can see what kind of effect it would have when you take a photograph right so now you'll know if uh that's another thing for high speed sync as well is if you take a picture with um if you take a picture without any strobes Flash. yeah yeah exactly if you take a picture without any like flashes strobes whatever, and just take a picture and it's pure black, when you introduce the light, that's where it's gonna be working with you for high speed sync. Um, the main thing with high speed sync is that instead of one strong flash that's popping out, it's gonna have multiple strobes that, uh, that go out to kind of capture because it's kind of hard for me to explain, but if you, instead of having a full exposure like this, it's actually going into a little slit, smaller slit, and it's traveling down. Right, so now the instead of having a strobe when it opens, it sh like it gets recorded through the sensor. It's going to be traveling down in a different time frame. So what the high speed sync actually needs to do is pop off the flash twice as it's traveling down. So uh, that's one thing to consider when you're using high speed sync. You're losing flash output because it has to uh, to expose or uh, pop off the the strobe in multiple occasions. So it, that's where it really changing your shutter speed and what you need to do to manage that is uh, going to be important.
Yeah, it's the little things in there because, you know, even as you can see in like the software right now, uh, back in the days of like film, <laughs> I'm old, <laughs> uh, but it used to be things like, hey, you had to learn all this stuff shot by shot. And one of the last things Robbie had up in the software there was he eliminated all of the strobes just to show the constant light. That's something we would do in the studio to be like, where is the gel hitting? So it would just be illuminated that way. And we just know like, hey, that's where the tones are hitting. But now the power of the output. Because that's why, I, and luckily Brian laughed along with me because he's also a, apparently a fellow control freak when it comes to the studio, is in a studio, you have no variables out there. You're very much still working within the, the triangle exposure, if you will, and that being shutter, aperture, and ISO. But you're controlling all of your light. So your ISO is kind of like not important in the thirds anymore, but you're manipulating mm -hmm. all of these sources to get the effects you want. And mm -hmm. as Robbie just went through there with high speed sync, there is a process of which it can be done. And that's where we're seeing now in a lot of the latest cameras, technology has brought us all this innovation, not only like software where we could see how things would come out, even live preview in like mirrorless is an amazing feature as well. But because of the lack of a mechanical shutter dropping down and working in this case in the electronic shutter, you can increase flash sync speeds substantially. Uh, substantially. And I saw uh, Juan Manuel, you just put it up there and yeah, that is, one of the things his questionnaire is on the alpha one he wants to get at that one four hundredth of a sync you can mm -hmm. do that in the a1 that's part of that processor that's part of that stack sensor and if we even want to push it a little bit further you crop yep. it down into APS-C mode you can actually get up to five hundredth of a second exactly which is sort of unheard of for some of the strobe stuff that's out there oh yeah yeah exactly so the a1 is just capable of going further and then having the uh, high speed sync, you could just take out all the ambient light. And I think that's an amazing feature to have. Uh, let's see, Eric Von Lockhart, he asked, what's your preference on studio flash? If you're traveling and you need somewhere like, uh, and you need something powerful, I highly suggest the Sony's HBL 60 RM2. That's a perfect stroke to have with you, especially it's gonna be, if it's gonna be overhead on like connected to your camera, because it will work with the eye autofocus. And that's like a very accurate TTL that's capable for your uh, for your camera and it'll be able to work with high speed sync and everything else and you could also rotate that head to be vertical so when normally uh, typical flash heads will just go and be with you if you rotate the camera vertically then it's also going to be rotated vertically but with the HVL 60 RM2 you could actually rotate the whole head to be back where it was originally so that's one of the advantages of the HBL 60 RM2. And uh, yeah, that's definitely a good route to go for if you're doing event photography and portraiture. The only thing uh, in like if you are doing studio photography um, is seeing how the light affects the photograph. In this situation here, even in this like mock uh, 3D studio, we're seeing how the lighting affects because they have a thing called studio light. Um, Moder like I think it's called modeling light. There you go. Uh, so if you're looking for a strobe that has a modeling light, you could also prep your shots very well. And that's something to keep in mind of when you're doing any of these studio shoots. Uh, that way you could kind of see how the lighting is affecting your model before you take the photograph and change the output for your strobe as well. So you want to make sure that the strobe has a modeling light. But if you want like the Porsche of all strobes, then <laughs> I would probably say Pro Photo. Do you have a preference there, Jason? Well, in this case, I uh, just want to say everything Robbie said there with our HVL flash system is perfect for using out on locations. And keep in mind, those flashes can also still work in the studio. Um, there's sometimes you have people, you know, they're sitting on a couch in a studio. You don't want to get a strobe behind them. You can put some of those flashes behind there to give a little separation, to give some light under furniture. Um, they're very practical to work alongside these other strobes. And uh, for Eric's question there on studio strobes, um, I am very much a, uh, a snob when it comes to lighting in some cases. <laughs> so for me, I would kind of go up there on the upper echelon as well as Robbie noted. But for me, everyone has that that one factor, that one feature, that's the selling point. And for me, it is flash consistency. Um, and for me, after many attempts at trying to go bargain budget on my lighting, and I must say, 
since then, because once again, I mentioned the days of film before, um, they've gotten a lot better with some of the constant light setups that are out there with constant color temperatures now staying there in a CRI value. But for me, it was always having one tenth of a stop flash consistency from shot to shot. If you're doing catalog work, product photography, even in this case, portraits for people, you can't let every few shots, the capacitors were not at full discharge with the output causing you know outfits to change complexion to change that led me into using a lot of pro photo uh, brawn color eventually i just kind of fell in love with uh, they're no longer available but the dynalite system they were making those one tenth of a stop consistencies they had some other things that were not as flashy as pro photo as brawn color but when I lost the modeling lamp on my Dynalites, I didn't have to, you know, drop two hundred dollars yeah. to get another modeling lamp. Uh, but when you kind of figure out the work you're doing in your strobe, if you're doing large events of like thirty people for a family portraiture, you're going to need strobes that can cover that area and have that light output. If you're doing more on location stuff and you still want to use strobes, your light output is going to be more based on overpowering the sun or once again the volume. It's one of those right now, there's so many companies out there making so many good products and a lot of them partnering out to work with Sony. It's really a, the best time really to get into using, you know, strobe photography because there's so many options. And with software like this and, you know, previews and all we could do with our dynamic range, it's very fun to go out there and just play sometimes to see how modifiers are working. Oh, yeah. Experiment with high speed sync. There's all kinds of things you can play with right there. And uh, we'll be fair and also note that Adorama has a excellent in-house strobe brand mm -hmm. at a very economical price point. Oh yeah. Flash You're welcome, point. Akiva. Amazing. Uh <laughs> <laughs> because you do have modeling lights there as well. And they do have the uh, like really great, like the one of their strobes also have lithium ion batteries. So you could just charge it and make sure it's good to go if you have a spare one and they do last a really long time. So definitely check out Flashpoint over there at Adorama because it's a great set, uh, especially if you're trying to not spend Porsche prices because you can get similar results. Uh, I would say that um, Profoto definitely has like um, expectation to meet in terms of color accuracy. But honestly, if the whoever it really depends on who's viewing it, I don't. I wouldn't want to take the risk if I'm doing a project for say, I don't know, Porsche themselves. <laughs> if I'm taking a photograph, but yeah. if it's for you know, if you're doing portraits for family, friends, or for your uh, business in the studio lighting, you have that capability there with Flashpoint as well. Yeah, uh, but yeah, Akiva has our link there. And Robbie, actually, have a, a question that's relevant to the subject here. And uh, Santos, we're going to be coming to your question on meters because I think that's going to be kind of on the tail end of this one. Uh, we have from Wayne, we, we've kind of talked a little bit about it here, but he wanted to know about working with different transmitters and lights in a portrait studio setting and mm. also the ability to do power adjustments on those transmitters and lights if your model is moving to prevent motion blur. All right, so we got, I think, four questions in one there from Wayne. <laughs> um, but one thing I will say, and this also piggybacks a little bit on the Flashpoint system. Um, it used to be everything had to be proprietary. Imagine a world where there were no generics, everybody. <laughs> you had to have this transmitter, this flash, and you made deal with it. Um, but that quote almost verbatim. Everyone look into Monty Zucker and Dean Collins, true masters of light, all of them were and we miss them dearly. Um, but some of the stuff is now you can get a mixture of strobes out there as long as you have the same transmitting signal. Um, mm -hmm. The Dynalite packs that I used had Pocket Wizard built into them. Profoto at one point had Pocket Wizard built into them. And now a lot of times you have like, hey, even Sony, here's our transmitter to work with our flashes. There are ways that if you just had a, a hodgepodge, a grab bag of here's all the strobes you can get, one, yeah, good luck on having the same color temperature from all of them. It's probably impossible. But you can do something where you can get a generic trigger and a generic receiver and have those mm -hmm. plugged into all those units. And therefore, it would be on that same signal. And Wayne, depending on whatever that system is, because it's going to be the transmitter company, which could be proprietary, like Profoto, Sony, etc. But if it's something generic and you're working with a bunch of other manufacturers, odds are you're getting that signal to fire them all at the same time. 
you're not going to get things like power adjustments and you're going to want to pretty much use a light meter which was part of santos question um, i personally have some old minolta meters that are classics that i would never give up uh, but right now i'd say Saconic is probably one of the better handheld meters you can get on the market and that's something where as i mentioned earlier control freak in the studio i want to know my exact meter reading here on someone's chin i want to know exactly under their chin i want to know their shoulder a light meter handheld could do that for you it can actually give you the math on the fall off of all of your light as well as now color temperature and other things that would be required in a studio um that's why like your control freak in the studio you are, have control over everything there is no obstacle of something getting in the way and the last part of wayne's question there it's in this case if you have to freeze a model you're going to have to move up the shutter speed and odds are you're going to have to increase the power output for the shorter shutter speed there to freeze the action yep absolutely for when you're trying to freeze a person in action that's where it really comes down to um well strobes want for one if you're using a studio lighting they could move as fast as they want because this like the the flash exposure is again one ten thousand of a second and the best thing is again the autofocus continuous you saw the photographs with the uh the the runway or not really the runway but the uh the photographs with the 20 subjects they were all moving towards me it didn't matter i was able to anticipate their movement just by half pressing on the shutter autofocus on and it was just locked in there for any of their movements and it was you could see here in the detail it's just like just locked on to their eyes you know so it's it's a pretty amazing tool when it comes to moving subjects as well and uh as far as controlling different light outputs when you're in a studio setting like this one um, if you want them to be in different power outputs, uh, if you have a controller, uh, say the Pro Controller that the uh, Flashpoints do have, I would set this this strobe to be Group A and this strobe to be Group B. So that way this could be at full power since it's a key light, the key light being the main source of light that's uh, lighting the subject. And then you can have this side light over here to be lower. So this is Group A. That's going to be for the key light group B. And if you introduce m multiple different lights, you could make that a, like a third light. Then you could make that a different power output to kind of just show a uh, tighter. Maybe if you just want to have like a little rim showing up in the back end over there, uh, then you could have that as group C. So being able to control multiple different lights is another way to really get uh, into studio photography. But again, one light is uh, a really good way to start uh, and that's why I chose to do one light for this subject here and if we go to uh, this one here one lighting if you subtract the red <laughs> uh, continuous lighting then you're pretty much just good to go with one light because as long as you have a good proper softbox or maybe a, a umbrella then you're pretty much good to go one thing I do want to note is that if a subject is too close to the wall, um, uh, let's bring this back over here, is that it can cast a shadow. So all I do is just tell them to move forward just a little bit. We're gonna hurt Jamal here. I'm just gonna move him to the wall and now he's gonna be inside the uh, <laughs> the this couch. This program is playing with all kinds of laws <laughs> of nature, but it's yeah. okay. Yeah. But you can see the shadow over here is really, uh, you know, it's showing up and we hate to see that kind of shadow be shown on the photograph but if you just tell them to move up just a little bit like one step you're able to move that shadow very like completely away from the photograph and it's not distracting anymore and that was just by moving it maybe two steps if it was in a studio so that's something to consider when you're taking photographs in studios to give them enough room uh, because that's one of the biggest advantages is not having that light really affect the photographs and lastly lenses right is it really depends on the kind of look. So this is 11 to 16 millimeter. So let's just say this is a 12 to 24 F4G or the F2.8 G Master. You could get cool effects like this. This might not be the most flattering photograph for your subject because it does distort in the corners. That's why long lenses with lens compression, something like 100, uh, this is a 7300 to 166 millimeters. You get a really nice uh, compressed photograph in terms of your lenses as well. So definitely keep that in mind. So again, 100 millimeters uh, is the 100 millimeter STF, which is uh, literally, uh, you know, 
my favorite lens. <laughs> you could get some really nice lens compression and you wouldn't get that kind of situation with a wide angle lens through that. But yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thanks yeah, for your questions, some, guys. There's some good questions in there. And really quickly for Rom, who is asking between the uh, A7 IV and the Alpha 1. What do you I got know there? what I I know what I did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for those exactly. I've been watching for a while. I, I pulled the trigger, as we've discussed on Mirrorless Monday. I now believe, as much as we discussed Robbie's S3 and the 100 STF, my usual camera bag was an A92 and an A7R4. I recently did trade in the A92, purchased the Alpha One. Zero regrets, as long as I don't look at my bank statement of how much <laughs> I got for the A92 compared to what I had bought it for. but it One four hundredth of a second sync speed, Jason. You're I, ready well, to go. CF Express A, <laughs> 9 million dot EVF, I'm good. The list goes um, on. There's some things there where the gear that you collect, whether it be cameras and lenses, we can't always forget the fact that there's things like light modifiers and strobe units that sometimes we just hold on to. Between Robbie and I, if we just look through our, our metaphorical junk drawers, which in mm -hmm. this case is a closet for both of us, where it's just like, that's where all these extra diffusers are. That's where reflectors are. Those are things that, you know, we don't really talk a lot about on our mirrorless Mondays, but it's like when we do photo walks with Adorama at times in a situation, we may be like, hey, we need to diffuse some of the sunlight out comes a diffuser. Oh, we need some more light for this portrait to light up the subject. They're in a dark spot, a reflector, where it could be a strobe firing into it or angling off of ambient light. There's a lot of things that you just build up over time. And I mean, upside is Adorama sells all of them. <laughs> so it's not one of those like back in the day, you gotta go to this place to get this, then you're gonna go here to do this. And by the way, here's the lab where you gotta go get it processed at. Um, no everything's longer. in a once, no longer, cursed technology <laughs> and development. <laughs> Um, yeah. But these things make imaging very fun, and it takes a lot of the frustration out of the learning curve. The software Robbie has been showing uh, everyone tonight, that's something that used to be like, hey, you would, you would have to convince your assistant to help you out for free or for lunch, begging your friends to sit there to have their portraits taken nonstop while being blinded by lights as you're perfecting everything and learning about you know, the, the triangular exposure there. There's a lot of things where this software can help you out, but it can also narrow down your shopping list to be like, oh, this is, it's once again simulated, but you would basically be able to tell, do I want a beauty dish or do I want a softbox? What are the effects I'll be getting from a grid? You know, all these things you can now sort of see in real time, just like an exposure on a mirrorless camera can help you take your portrait photography to a new level. I would love to say how it's always just our gear and our lenses, and trust me, it's a very big part of it in the end results, but it's how you're using it where you can maximize the capabilities of your camera. I'm looking forward to actually doing some testing this week in high speed sync with my Alpha One. I am gonna be pulling out my Dynalite strobes because I've got some 500 watt second packs, which very are nice. low powered, which can get me that big flash output where I'm not worried about it needed to full charge at 2000 or anything like that. Yep. The more we exactly. play, the more our portraits get better, I assure you. Absolutely. And there was a few more comments as well. I think Santos, I don't know if we touched upon it, Jason, uh, if it matters shooting vertically, if you're using a uh, uh, high speed sync, did, did we touch on that or no? Uh, some of it is going to affect the process as Robbie was mentioning basically how that shutter is going and how the light is outputting. It'll be yeah. a different effect. Uh, but yeah. it's something that you could just plan accordingly yeah. for. Yeah, it would be similar because if if the light it doesn't affect if it doesn't uh, if you're not having issues with your strobes at all, then you're not going to see a problem if you shoot vertically. But if you are seeing an issue, then it's going to happen both ways. Either vertically, you're just going to see the lines are going to be vertical or horizontal. So just and, be uh, mindful with high speed sync. Yeah, for actually one person I know recently who was going through that exact same process. And I had actually asked, you know, did you have to rotate your stuff? He's like, I've got 50 megapixels. I'll just crop it vertical. And I'm yep. like, well, there, there's one answer. If you don't yeah, want to exactly. move stuff around, well, the that's resolution the best part is about... there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, with the, uh, I know we're kind of rolling back to the light meters, but if the model has time and patience, uh, you could just, we have, we're not using film. So uh, you probably said that already, <laughs> but uh, 
just a little bit. But yeah, you can just continue taking shots and mess around with your aperture and uh, and whatever you need to to get it. But again, ISO and shutter speed will not matter too much in those photographs, just because if you're using the full power and you're not in high speed sync, it, those things the light's going to be constant. ISO will affect it a little bit more because you're allowing more sensitivity to light, uh, but it's more for ambient lighting than it is. So if you could go lower in ISO, especially with strobes, you're pretty much golden. Uh, did we miss anything else? Let's see. Uh, well, limeters, good to have, like you said there. I believe you used, like, if you're shooting for Porsche and stuff, yeah, all those I things, have a light meter. the higher your, uh, your gear is going to, you're like, not only do I need a light meter, I need a spot meter attachment mm -hmm. to it. Um, in this case, plenty of deals out there. I'm sure Adorama has plenty available. Uh, currently, I'm running with Sakonic meters, and that's just been my branded choice ever since I had a 308. So uh, I got married to that brand at a young age. What can I say? Mm -hmm. um, Eric asking if you ever like to use uh, for your portrait work continuous lights. Hell yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, in that same setup. It, Especially like, with models with epilepsy. They definitely love continuous light yeah. better. Uh, <laughs> the only thing I would consider is what kind of mo like uh, modeling light or any continuous light. Just because in continuous lighting, uh, if you're using the type of like light bulbs where it, turn, it depending on how strong it is, it can make or uh, it could kind of melt the makeup if they're running hot. So that's why they were they used to be called hot lights. But um, if you do use LED, that won't really affect temperature too much nowadays, and they're pretty far away. But it's definitely something to consider if you're using continuous lighting, is how much power and how much heat it's giving off when you're using continuous lighting. But typically, you're pretty much good. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll say it's, it's going to be good, and if you're using continuous lights in some kind of studio atmosphere for people's makeup, uh, complexion, could be products, you want to have a continuous light that has a good CRI value on it, so it's going to maintain a good calendar output. So you're looking at like 98 or 99 or above, and you should be solid. And it's just a yeah. matter of how much power you need. Let's say you were, if you were using this Ari, <laughs> like a Fresnel light, they're going to be that makeup's gone. I mean, you can see how much stronger this light is, but yeah, it's uh, it's going to cause some uh, problems in terms of temperature for you. So. Uh, using any con like these LED lights uh, that we have here or in the setup, uh, you're probably fine most of the time. Nine, eight, maybe seven times out of ten, it's yeah. not really going to affect it. And uh, if you're looking to learn, so yeah, if you're looking to learn more about like lighting too, I always advise people start out with continuous lighting. That's how you're seeing it in real time in your camera with the effects. The strobe always has to fire, and you got to see your results. But real time adjustments with continuous lighting. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I think I was changing and I didn't realize that I was messing around with the program. That's okay. You kept staring at the ceiling. It looked I, That's all I did. Uh, oh, man. I was talking about this light here. Uh, that's this okay. Uh, this will melt his makeup. That's what I meant to do. <laughs> that Now that I believe you named him Jamal. Uh, oh, yeah. That's the model's makeup. name. Here, yeah, hold on. Yeah. We got Jamal here. We have uh, Alexandra and Kim. <laughs> It's uh, it's one of those fun things where I can't say it happens. Um, we've got some more questions that are coming in. Um, sure, hit me. We have from Sean who wanted to know about video using a mirrorless camera. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's um, uh, it's amazing. I mean, kind of an open-ended question, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so with influencers, especially for New York Fashion Week, in that topic uh, specifically. Uh, if you use a lot of the newer cameras, the a7R4 and above, like the a7 IV, the ZV-E10, if you record vertically, it will also transfer to your cell phone vertically, which is a big help for a lot of social media, which is a big thing for influencers. So it could just go straight to reels and you could edit it very quickly. So the only other thing I would consider is the kind of bit rate when you're trying to transfer those files. So if you're using something like... Uh, you want to be 1080p typically 30 frames per second and consider your bit rate which is like i think the the smallest one is 1080p at 16 megabits per second so it could transfer to your phone much quicker and that way you could work with influencers and uh, creating content for them which will they will find very valuable and you get this nice shallow depth of field that we're getting um, from a full frame or APS-C size camera so definitely consider that as well if you're doing video but that was a great question. Thank you, 
Sean, uh, let's see. Let's see. We've Missing we had anything a, else? Yeah, we've got a few more that were in the chat here as well. Uh, we had a few people asking about uh, new cameras and noting that according to the well, internet, there, there were supposed to be new cameras today, but... I thought it was tomorrow, I September 6th, I saw on YouTube. Well, and the, well, there is a scheduled announcement, I believe, from Sony on the 6th, but as we've said many times over, you guys can always send us as many things as you would like to bribe us for information. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll set up a P.O. box where donations can be sent. Uh, but the sad truth of the matter is we will find out about five minutes before everyone else does. Yeah. And that's an email saying, by the way, in three minutes, we're going to have a call and you need to be on it to learn about a new product. Yeah. Um, but it is one of those, as many people have worked with over the years, have said, hey, there's always going to be a new car every year. Um, yeah. So it's one of those things where it's like you can buy this year's model at a great price or you can spend more or wait for this one. Uh, but always the best camera and any kind of combination, the one you have with you, you get what you want. I'm loving my Alpha One right now, which the rumors online, everyone's like, isn't there supposed to be another Alpha One? I'm like, I just bought it. Uh, <laughs> and it's yep. going to be fine for about five years. It uh, just had a firmware update too, which was amazing. So. 1.3 is pretty amazing on air. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of perks, but in this case, never get uh, horse blinders on when you're looking at something online. Um, odds are, I mean, you could. Robbie showed stuff with the original A7S today, and it's still as fabulous as it was then. I love it. Yeah. So it's upgrade as you need to upgrade if the gear goes bad on you, or in this case, you're getting further into content creation and. This gear makes it a lot easier to do it with the focus, the resolution, power. There's all kinds of things that can be in play. The more educated you are, the better decisions you can yep. make. I mean, the A7S original, That's those photographs are still on my personal website. Um, and like good photographs remain good photographs if they're good photographs, you know? <laughs> so sometimes there's times for upgrades. Uh, maybe you'll find new uh, pictures out there that you want to put in to showcase. But again, um, I still have a lot of work that's been taken back 2016, 2012 even, because uh, I was using the A900 back then. That was my first full frame <laughs> camera, and that those are those pictures are still on my website that uh, is being showcased. But yeah. I should get the Minolta gear out right now for that comment. But, right, <laughs> uh, it's, it's on a different side of the office. I know. Um, yeah. We have a, a two-parter here in this question because I think they kind of work hand in hand. Uh, we had Santos in the chat here asking if we know of any photographers needing a helper or an assistant to let him know because he wants to get out there more in the field, which also I think kind of goes with this question we received from Stan here as well. What process do you go through when shooting in a new venue that you've not previously shot at? Oh, and, well, yeah, well, there was a lot and, of In some cases, <laughs> that's that's how those things work. Sometimes yeah. I have... I have been called in to help someone out because I have shot there and that person has not. Um, exactly. So to Stan's question there, like process of first thing, if you haven't shot at a venue before, well, if you know you're going there, do a little R&D on your own first, whether it be seeing what's around there, see if you can visit it early, talk to other photographers who have worked there to get any perks out and yeah. some place you've been or you haven't been, but you know someone who has, guess what? they probably wouldn't mind coming with you to help. And yeah. for Santos in your question, I put in the chat there, you start local. There's a lot of photographers who don't mind. It's a lot easier now than it was back in the day with like, hey, carry this 130 pounds of lighting gear up five flights of steps. We'll see you on the top. Um, that's how it used to be to cut your teeth. Now it's maybe you only got to hold a camera bag and bring them coffee yeah. and stuff like Santos. that. Santos. Yeah, put your uh, put your at like Instagram handle maybe on and everyone too. I welcome you guys to put your Instagram handle. Mine and Jason's are right over here below our names. And if you guys want to put your your handle over there in our chat, feel free. And maybe you know, Santos. If if anyone needs help, Santos is there. <laughs> but, yeah, if, if you're near Santos, uh, or yeah, if you're willing yeah. to fly Santos out, I don't know. Yeah, in you many know, ways, he's helping. Uh, yeah, if he's in the if he's in the area. Yeah. Uh, just hit them up and honestly just networking and meeting other people because you know the the Japan festival and meeting all those uh, those models there or 
um, the subjects, they were kind enough for me to share. They were willing to take my information and maybe continue working with them if I needed to call them up and have a shoot. And also working with new locations, I would say as we continue photographing, we start noticing how light affects um, anything really when you're in the shade and broad sunlight there's a lot of things to consider so I would really keep an eye out to like I find the shade my safe spot when it becomes uh, too bright if we're photographing at 2 p.m. or we can honestly just get a um, light diffuser you could get a 5-in-1 reflector and that could also diffuse the light if you really are in a tight spot and you have no choice you have to be out shooting in the open area there's no shade to hide into you could get a reflector you could get a diffuser that could just fold out and you could have someone hold it up for you as well so um definitely worth considering as well but yeah the more you're with people the more you learn some of these things like hey you're gonna hold this diffuser and here's why you pick up knowledge through osmosis and yeah. robbie mentioned earlier that's how you also can pick up some shooting styles and ideas and mold them into your own it's by going through all these process and overcoming the obstacles along the way. Um, yep. Eric, just so you know, we're, I can answer this question for you right now. The last APS-C camera we had come out was the ZV-E10. Yep. See my earlier disclaimer of how we will find out five minutes before yeah. we won't know. You do. Really. Uh, so. I'm excited to know any new announcements. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but if you we have some information we don't, we'll take <laughs> it. Uh, but the fact is, Sony is very good usually with the, I mean, it's, it's a rarity. They're keeping even it from see us it on too. The, yeah. Well, it's always kept from us. Uh, but <laughs> with the exception of, I believe, when the S3 was announced, uh, very rarely did you see, like, oh, here's the date, big announcement. Um, there is one saying there will be an announcement from Sony. It is dated. It is on the YouTube channel. That countdown's been going for, I believe, 10 days. But never have we ever seen, with the exception of the S3, where it had the countdown and a S behind it. So yeah. everyone kind of knew what was coming. Um, but Robbie and I have both the privilege, honor, and at times, unluckily drawn name to sometimes go to events where it's like, what do we have to do? What are we setting up? And we want to be there as photo geeks. We want to see the new product. We want to get our hands on it. And it'll be like maybe three to four hours of setting something up in 10 minutes before the, the press goes live. Someone will be like, by the way, here's what's being announced. And we're just like, ah, oh, let us hold it. <laughs> yeah. So it's, we're there with you on the enthusiasm. And Sony has not disappointed with all the products that are coming out, um, whether it be firmware updates. The ZVE 10, believe it or not, is becoming one of my favorite little toys to play with. The A7 IV has become amazing with the last firmware update for me to pair with Imaging Edge, like Robbie mentioned early on the new 1635 power zoom lens, all these new toys come out and it's just, that's why we keep getting more. That's how our closets get full of stuff. Um, that's something that the more you shoot, the more toys you're gonna wanna get. And it's just being aware of what's out there, but always look at the stuff like, how am I gonna use it? Because if there's yeah. some specs and you're like, why would I be messing with high speed sync? I don't even work with strobes. Well, maybe that's not the camera you were looking for at that point. There might be something better suited to what you want to use. That's why we do these mirrorless Mondays. Yes. Because I know we and went a lot of room for growth. There's yeah. just room for growth. Yeah. And in this case, part of me feels like we should even do more justice for uh, environmental portraiture because we did yeah. a little bit of both. But I think we were we only had one software program showing inside studio strokes. Yeah, I don't have any um, software for yeah. uh, 3D with uh, <laughs> being yeah. in broad daylight. Although, that would be pretty cool. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there's probably one out there. Yeah, but I would, cool. I would. Everyone should always, I think, do some of like what are those basic, you know, photo 101 courses. Uh, some of them called them like, you know, zone house experiments. Where just here's how the shot changes with the position of the light. That could be a, an artificial light going like in an arc around a subject. It yep. could be just outside and seeing how the sun falls through different parts of the day on a stationary object. The more you learn, the more you know you can get into these things and have a better understanding. And I own my light meters. I love my light meters. I'm never getting rid of them. Um, I probably only use it once or twice a month though. Mm -hmm. I'm shooting about three to four times a week. <laughs> because yeah, we at one point, chances. Yeah, we, we've got it all in our heads now. Robbie and I are like, we're waiting to go on that Jeopardy show where it's like all this pointless information will now be realized yep. versus just our automatic 
knowing how to adjust something on the fly. Exactly. And we had a comment here from Eric Von Lockhart as well, who said, I always have my assistants jot down questions during a photo shoot. And at the end of the day, explain why uh, I did what I did. And honestly, if uh, Eric, if you're in the New York area, you know, Santo, I know a guy. <laughs> Yes, well, <laughs> Santos is in the realm there. And Eric, yeah. good on you for doing it in that polite way. I can't count yeah. how many times where working with someone as an assistant at the end of the day, they would uh, open up their little notebook and let us all know how we failed them at particular yeah, exactly. times throughout the day. So it's nice to know someone is being a constructive teacher out there. Yeah, <laughs> when it's not constructive, I always, I don't know, I don't really hang out with those people any further just because uh, when you're trying to learn and improve yourself, then uh, if they just say your photo sucks, you're not getting much out of that. You're just getting your feelings hurt. And I don't like that. <laughs> so I always try to find people that uh, have a critiquing circle that just try to, to tell you something you can improve, um, but not a group that always says this is a great shot because that's not really constructive either. If there's anything you can improve, uh, try to find a good balance uh, when it comes down to it. And uh, yeah, like even this photograph here, um, it's fine, but I started notice that and started noticing that the backdrop had a fold here, and so there's like this weird thing, and then there was a bend here. You could barely see it. Photoshop could easily take care of it. Maybe not this part of the photograph. I thought it was shadow from here. Yeah, all that was yeah, all on like purpose. Nice light, nice. Yeah. Couldn't get Who's the gonna shadow, notice? So no one really. Yeah. <laughs> it, like uh, no one's really gonna notice but me for this situation. But again, uh, what are you gonna do? Uh, so yeah. Like, so just always consider new possible situations. Uh, this was with a slower shutter speed, and this is where I relied on uh, the strobe to kind of uh, help me with the lighting here uh, with the hand motion there. And th with the catch light, you could also see that I was only using one light here. I was using an octobox. So this is what I mean by catch light. Um, so make sure you keep an eye out for that if you're ever bored. Oh, you can actually see this here as well. My well I was about to say, this is also a good <laughs> example of not trying to purposely freeze everything because that little bit of blur with the left hand coming down, obviously hitting the balls, balloons there, whatever you got, that adds yeah. to the shot. She's still oh, yeah. perfectly still, but we're, we're illustrating a little bit of motion. So exactly. just for those taking notes at home, there are times you do want a little bit of a blur. Yep. Exactly. And don't be afraid to use wide angle lenses too, because they can also help uh, extenuate the, you know, the environment when you're doing environmental portraiture. And you could have a better view of the buildings around you or maybe extenuate legs to be longer or like different parts of the body in terms of form and take advantage of that. And then, uh, you know, just uh, have a good time, really. And don't be afraid to try crazy filters too, because this one was a aero 50 like a infrared kind of imitator and it turned all the green stuff and kept skin tones pretty okay uh so that was fun photoshop <laughs> that bridge a bit there Robbie. yeah it's a little orange <laughs> a little that's orange fine. on that bridge that's but, fine you know. that's what that's what the fake aero uh infrared <laughs> cameras do <laughs> yeah that's that's just us being a, a nitpick on that yeah. one um <laughs> but it's it's the fact is for what used to be waiting to get stuff done in a dark room or waiting to do all these things in like trial and error there's so much now that you could do with technology where it's just so much fun right out of the box and we'll probably look to do some more stuff and you know make sure everyone that just as you found out about mirrorless monday here stay tuned on all of adorama's social media we're trying to get some more practical things where you get to see the uh the humor that is robbie and i in real time and in person again we're going to try to have some more experiences coming up in the next few months so exactly. it's going to be a, a fun time for everyone and you know you can actually see robbie's and take selfies with his S3 and 100 STF. Probably. Not using probably it, but just with him holding STF. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. just a picture of it there and he'll sign but yours yeah. or something. If uh, you guys are in the New York area, though, keep your eyes open for a future event uh, that will be coming up hopefully in October. We're still getting everything geared up and lined up for it. So uh, I'm sure you'll get an email if you are subscribed to Adorama or their Eventbrite. Uh, but you should see something coming up um, then. If you guys are in the New York area, we'd love to see you. 
Um, but other than that, Mirrorless Mondays, you could also scroll down and you can see our past Mirrorless Mondays as well. And we were able to hang out, not just me and Jason, but we were able to have some amazing guests like uh, Carlos Alvarado is a great wedding photographer and we spoke about that there or we just talk about different talking points and if you do have any suggestions feel free to leave it in the chat we'd love to hear uh, what you have and any kind of um, topics you'd like to cover I know we're gonna probably be doing something with video uh, especially with some firmware updates for even the Sony Xperia line, the Xperia Pro. They, you can now see waveform and even false colors and live stream straight from your cell phone. The a7 IV, right Jason, that you're oh, using? I yeah. got it going, yeah. Yeah, you got the USB uh, streaming feature there, uh, so you could I'm just... I'm working some streaming, yeah. Yeah, there you go. So yeah. you're you're connected directly to the a7 IV right now, and you could connect that to the Sony Xperia phone and live stream straight from there. So there's a lot of cool things coming up in the future, especially with Mirrorless Mondays. And uh, I really do appreciate, Jason, for you coming out and hanging out as usual and uh, being another guiding light. Uh, to uh, you know helping me handle chat because you guys were great as well. Thank you guys for coming um, But yeah, and in this case uh, Eric we wish you luck with Santos Santos. We wish you luck with Eric. Yeah uh, We are bringing <laughs> the world together one mirrorless Monday at a time So yeah. uh, we hope that works out and we'll have to have you guys let us know if you're coming out to any of the Adorama Sony photo events so that way Robbie and I can sit there and realize what we've done. Uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But yeah, other than that, guys, I think we're going to end the live stream here. I really appreciate everyone's time. And um, have a wonderful night. Have a wonderful rest of your Labor Day. And thank you guys for, your, you know, taking, your, taking the time out to be with us here, especially from wherever you are in the world, you know? It's been a really fun time here. And Jason, as usual, thank you. Akiva, thank you for uh, helping us assist here and being our main go-to guy. And yeah, have a wonderful day, guys. Take care. All right. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. See ya.